Hello, and welcome to the Esri GeoDev webinar series. This webinar is a continuation of the series we created in the hopes of engaging in developer-related topics and discussions in between Dev Summits. We have our Developer Summit Europe coming up October 23rd through 25th, and we would love to have conversations like these taking place throughout the year so that when we do meet in October, it will be as though we never stopped. We hope you get as much or more out of this webinar than you anticipated. Now we would like to introduce you to today's webinar using TypeScript with the ArcGIS API for JavaScript and to introduce Noah Sager, product engineer, and Renee Rubelkava, software engineer. Noah, let's get started, shall we? Sounds good. Thank you, Amy. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, again, my name is Noah Sager. I'm here with Renee Rubelkava. Uh, we both work with the JavaScript API team. And today's webinar, using TypeScript with the ArcGIS API for JavaScript. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, today's agenda, we're going to start off talking about the ArcGIS API for JavaScript, the 4.x version. Uh, TypeScript does work with the 3.x version as well, but today we're going to focus on the 4.x version. Uh, then we're going to briefly talk about what TypeScript is and why you should consider using it. Then Renee is going to show you a couple awesome demos about converting an actual JavaScript application to TypeScript. We'll talk a little bit about some development resources that are available to you. Um, then Renee is going to show you how to create custom widgets, and we'll end up with the special tool that Renee designed. All right, so the ArcGIS API for JavaScript is Esri's flagship web API. It uses modern browser technology, both on computers and mobile devices, to enable powerful workflows with optimized performance to display large quantities of data. So for the purposes of this webinar, we're going to assume that you have some degree of familiarity with the JavaScript API. Um, if not, the best place to start is with the online SDK. Uh, we have a series of guide topics that are very readable. They explain the fundamentals of working with the API, um, some concepts of working with a, a web API, um, as well as some resources if you're migrating from the 3.x world to the 4.x world. Uh, the current version of the API is 4.8, and we anticipate releasing version 4.9 later this week. Um, and as a fun fact, uh, as of right now, about 88% of our API is currently written in TypeScript. So we're not just promoting using it, we're actually using it ourselves. All right, so what is TypeScript? TypeScript is an open source programming language that is a superset of JavaScript. It adds optional static typing, enhanced IDE support, and compiles down to plain JavaScript. Now, there are countless articles and blogs about TypeScript that you can find online, but today we're gonna go over just a couple of the highlights. So first, TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript. Uh, so what does that actually mean? Uh, that means that uh, valid JavaScript code is valid TypeScript code. You could almost rename your JavaScript files to TypeScript files, just replace the .js to a .ts. Um, you can start using TypeScript today. Um, and as we'll see in some examples, TypeScript code looks a lot like JavaScript code. Um, there's a few differences, but they're, they're largely the same. Um, and one other fun fact to hit you with is uh, there's a TypeScript compiler that we're going to look at later, and the TypeScript compiler is actually written in TypeScript. So there's a cool little TypeScript inception for you. All right, now why should you use TypeScript? So there's a bunch of reasons. We're going to cover just a couple right now to kind of entice you to consider using it. Uh, the first is, as the name implies, TypeScript adds type support to JavaScript. So what does that look like? So here I have a very small code snippet. Um, I'm defining a, a const URL and giving it a string to a feature layer that I'm interested in. Um, and then I'm using a create feature layer function. And this function takes in two parameters. One is URL and one is legend. Um, after that, I call the create feature layer function and I pass in the URL that I find at the top and then I pass in uh, the statement true. Now in the parameters, I have this URL colon string and I have legend colon boolean. What I'm doing there is I'm assigning the type that those variables are going to be um, and letting the TypeScript compiler know what to expect there. So the URL will be of type string and the legend will be of type Boolean. There's a bunch of useful reasons to do that, but one of the main ones is readability so that if someone else is reviewing my code, they know exactly what those variable types are supposed to be. Um, or if I'm reviewing my own code, you know, a couple days or a couple months from now, it's really easy to see uh, what kind of variables I was expecting there. So what goes along with that is this idea of enhanced IDE support. So on the JavaScript team, a lot of us use Visual Studio Code. Um, it was created by Microsoft, and TypeScript was also created and maintained by Microsoft. So it has a lot of really good support out of the box. 
Now, there are other IDEs out there that you could use. Um, a lot of them do support TypeScript. Uh, some of them require some manual setup to actually get them configured properly. Uh, but Visual Studio Code is free and it works out of the box with TypeScript. So let's take a look at, Renee is gonna show you some really cool features of that IDE support, but I'm gonna show you one now that I find super useful. So very similar function here, but this time I've assigned a value to my const URL as an integer, it's one, two, three, four, five. Now before I even run the application right at a compile time, uh, the IDE is barking at me, telling me that I made an error. So I tried to assign type integer um, to a parameter that's expecting a type string. So before I even run the application, while I'm doing my code design, um, I'm already getting this IntelliSense feature that's telling me that I made a mistake, I need to go back and correct it in the code. So that's a super, super useful feature of TypeScript. Another benefit is that it makes use of the latest JavaScript features. So if you've read about JavaScript, you've seen things about ECMAScript 5, ECMAScript 6, 7, 8. Um, there's a lot of really cool features that are coming down the pipes and uh, TypeScript can make use of a lot of those. So as an example of one, on the left here, I have a make webinar function, which calls a get JSON function, and the get JSON function returns a promise. Once the promise is resolved, it calls another function called question. So if you're used to working with promises, you've seen this syntax before, this idea of nested functions and dot then statements, and you kind of follow along to figure out where you're going. Now on the right, I'm gonna show you those same functions, but this time we're using a sync await. Since we make the make webinar function and a sync function, we can use the await method on the get JSON function to wait until the promise is resolved. So we get the exact same result as on the left, but with fewer lines of code, and it's actually a little bit more readable. Okay, another cool thing is called dynamic imports. So a lot of times you'll load all your import statements at the beginning of the application, um, and then you'll have all those loaded in, and there's a little bit of cost to getting every module that you need. Um, with dynamic imports, you actually can import those modules on an on-demand basis. So that means you could import a module inside a function, and if that function doesn't get called, you never have the cost of actually importing that module. So this can save you some resources and some time loading your application up front, um, and actually give you a bit more control over when those modules come into play. All right, so we've talked a lot about the JavaScript API, what TypeScript is, why you should consider using it. So let's turn it over to Renee, and let's go ahead and take a look at some actual uh, real life applications of using TypeScript. Renee? So, so uh, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about how you can convert the JavaScript to TypeScript. Now, since TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript, the actual conversion can be done in a few steps. Here we have a sample of some JavaScript code that you might write for the ArcGIS API for JavaScript on the left-hand side. And what you would normally do is use a require function to require some modules. And then you go ahead and start doing something with those modules. In our case, we're gonna create a web map and then create a map view. Now, if you want to convert this over to TypeScript, you can go ahead and you can change that require function to import statements. So on the left-hand side here, I'm going to do a import map view from Esri Views map view, and then import web map from Esri web map. That's really the only major change I've made to this code. The rest of the code pretty much stays the same, except for changing the var keyword to a const keyword. So if you want to get started to convert your JavaScript apps to TypeScript, you can almost do it in just a few simple steps uh, by changing those require statements into import statements. And the next thing you would want to do is to replace the var keyword with either the const keyword or the let keyword. The difference between the two is that if you say, uh, use const to define a variable, you're defining a contract saying that you are not going to be changing that variable over the lifetime of its use. Uh, if you use the let keyword, then you can change the, uh, the variable uh, during any time that you want to use it. And the next step would be to define uh, some types and or interfaces that you might want to use in your application. So let's look at a basic application structure for a TypeScript application. Um, and here I have just a simple little app. I have an app folder with a main.ts file. And then uh, we have some other supporting files in here, but the interesting one we're going to look at right now is down at the bottom of this list, the tsconfig.json. So the tsconfig is where you would define how you want TypeScript to compile your code. 
by the bare minimum, uh, this is what you would use to compile an application using the ArcGIS API for JavaScript. You want to define the module output as AMD modules. This is going to create a JavaScript code that's going to have the define function wrapping your code, uh, kind of how you would normally do it if you just wrote straight JavaScript, but we'll let the compiler hand it for us. The next thing you want to do is you want to have target be ES5. And this is so you can have a good browser compatibility for your application. And the final step you'd want to do is this ES module interop. Now this one's really interesting because uh, this will let you use the regular syntax of import map view from as reviews map view. Uh, instead of having to write import map view equals require as reviews map view. And this was a, a recent addition to uh, TypeScript and the TypeScript supporting libraries that we're able to take advantage of. And then finally, you want to tell the compiler where your TypeScript files are. That way it knows where it's going to be compiling everything. There's also other options you can do. So if you want to take advantage of using async await in your applications, you need to add this lib property and tell the compiler what uh, features you want to use. In this case, we'll be using DOM, uh, ES2015.promise, and ES5. This lets you do things like use async await as well as uh, geolocation and other web APIs. The next step you probably would want to do for development purposes is uh, turn source maps on. This way you can go ahead and you can debug the source TypeScript files for your application instead of trying to debug the output JavaScript files, which could be a little bit difficult. The next thing you probably want to do is to set this flag for no implicit any. Now, any is a type that you can use in TypeScript when you don't really know what the structure of your type is going to be. Uh, you can just define it as any and uh, you can use it with the compiler. But what this flag says is that you can still use any, any type, you just have to declare it ahead of time instead of uh, just letting the compiler infer that something will be any. And hand to hand with that is this uh, suppress implicit any index errors, long one there. Uh, set that to true and this just means that you'll be able to go ahead and iterate over objects that you haven't defined types for. Uh, if you don't do this, you'll get some uh, some errors here and there with TypeScript. And finally, the last three are going to be used for custom widget development, which we'll take a look at later on. So we're going to take a look at some TypeScript features right now. Uh, we're going to look at uh, types and interfaces, what the differences are, when you might use one over the other. Uh, we'll look at type guard, which is pretty interesting. And then we'll look at an example of dynamic imports. So in this sample here, I've got a function, a couple of functions here that look very similar, uh, run all queries and run all client queries. And the only difference between these two is that one is gonna run a query task on a query and the other one is gonna be able to uh, query the layer view uh, with, with the query as well. Now you notice I have two different types coming in here. I have a search item type and I have a feature item type. And when you put an array next to a type like this, that means that you're telling the TypeScript compiler that this items variable is going to be an array of search items. And we can see these types defined right here. I have my type search item here. That's a syntax for defining a type. I have a type feature item here. They're very similar, except the feature item instead of uh, has the addition of a layer view property on top of it. Now this could be a little uh, wordy. Maybe I um, uh, want to do something a little different here. The only limitation with types in TypeScript is that you cannot extend types. If you want to extend types, for example, I want feature item to extend the search item type, and I just want to add the layer view property, then you have to define them as interfaces. So I can update that here. So interface search item, I can remove the equals. Now that's set up. Now I can do uh, interface feature item, and I'm gonna say that feature item is going to extend search item. And now I can remove the query and ID properties from here. And if I look at my functions again, you'll see that the compiler is happy. And it's not complaining about any errors because this value is still equal to, I'm sorry, this interface still matches this interface just with an additional value on here. Now let's take a look at type guards. Type guards are really interesting. They're a lot of fun because what you can do is that you can say that, for example, I want to bring in the geometry type from Ezra Geometry. And if we look at the type for geometry, we can see that's gonna be either an extent 
multi-point point polygon polyline or mesh. Now, I might want to do something different depending on the type of geometry I get back. What I can do is that in this if block, I can check if geometry type geometry type is equal to point. And if it is, in this block, the compiler knows I'm dealing with a point geometry. So now I have access to uh, longitude, I have access to geometry dot uh, latitude, and the compiler is going to be happy here. The same happens if I check for properties inside the object. So if rings is in geometry, then I know I have a polygon. So now I can access uh, geometry dot centroid, for example, and be able to log that out and work with it. And if I don't have any of those, the compiler knows that it needs to be either an extent, multi-point, polyline, or mesh down at the bottom in here. So that's how you can deal with type guards to be able to uh, use TypeScript in your applications. Uh, another interesting bit we have here is uh, dynamic imports. Now, dynamic imports are really interesting because you can lazy load parts of the JavaScript API as you need them. In this case here, I have a React component. And in this component, I might want to uh, load my map view, but only when the component's been mounted to the page. So when it's mounted, I'm just going to use the import syntax. I'm going to import the map view. Uh, but what you get when you do this isn't the map view directly, uh, because it's going to have a, uh, the way the map view is defined, it's export equals map view, or you want to export the default map view. So what you actually get back is an object that's going to have a default uh, property on it. And that default property is actually going to be the map view. That's why I do new map view constructor dot default here to create my map view. And then I can just go ahead and pass it the property that I'm interested in. This is really useful for being able to lazy load stuff in your applications. And when you build your apps with something like Webpack and stuff, um, it's going to go ahead and create these bundles for you that are going to be much more uh, efficient when you're building your apps. So we covered a simple example, we covered the more involved example, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it back over to Noah. Awesome. Thank you, Renee. Yeah. So Renee showed us some really excellent examples of actually working with um, TypeScript and the JavaScript API. And now we're going to go ahead and look at some resources that are available to you uh, as developers. All right. So let me just go back here. Okay. So the best place to start is actually with the online SDK. We have a guide topic called TypeScript Setup. Um, this is a great spot to find out what the prerequisites are to working with TypeScript and what kind of versions of Node or NPM you might need, um, as well as how to actually install the typings. Um, then the guide guides you through writing your first simple application um, and then compiling it and actually running it in your browser. So if you're interested in getting the typings themselves, they're located on GitHub in the Esri JSAPI dash resources repository. Um, this repository gets updated at every release. Um, if you find any issues with the typings, if you find that we're missing typings for like a method or a renderer, um, you can go ahead and create an issue in the repository and one of our developers will look into it. Along with that, we have a number of blogs that have been written about working with TypeScript and the JavaScript API. Uh, Renee actually wrote a blog um, in the early days of 4.x development about using TypeScript. And another member of our team has written about the improved uh, TypeScript uh, typings and the, the IDE support uh, working with the JavaScript API, as well as a tutorial about actually creating a custom tile layer with TypeScript. And uh, just as an aside, the PowerPoint has all the links to all these different resources that we're talking about today. Um, and we're going to host the PowerPoint online later so you can access all these links yourselves. Uh, we also have videos from uh, Dev Summits of years past. There's one from 2017 that Renee actually delivered, um, and one from this past year, 2018, um, about the exact same topic using TypeScript with the ArcGIS API for JavaScript. Now, there are enough differences between the two videos and this current webinar that I think it'd be worth your time to go back and review them. Um, you can get a lot out of each of these videos. And of course, the last place to, uh, to mention is the TypeScript uh, website itself. Um, it's updated uh, regularly by Microsoft, and it's got a lot of really good documentation that can cover the nitty-gritty of actually working with TypeScript. All right, so let's go ahead and look at some of the documentation that we have for working with it. So Accessor 
um, is an abstract class that facilitates the access to instance properties as well as a mechanism to watch for property changes. So this is something that's really useful for creating or extending custom classes. Um, and it's also necessary for custom widget development. However, Accessor is not necessary just to use TypeScript with our API, but if you want to do any of these custom classes, custom widgets, then you're going to want to get comfortable with Accessor. So every subclass of Accessor defines properties that are accessible by using the get or set methods, um, and you can also watch for property changes using the watch method. So some examples of extending Accessor are actually the map view and scene view that we use internally. As you can see, we have a guide topic that kind of walks you through how to get, set, watch properties. Um, and then we also have an API reference page um, that you can refer back to. So alongside this concept of accessor is decorators. So decorators are a thing in different languages. I believe they're a thing in C Sharp. I know they're definitely something in Python and they're something in TypeScript itself. But Esri has our own uh, class of decorators that you can use to help you with your widget design with TypeScript. So decorators allow you to define and modify behavior of existing properties, methods, and constructors at the time that you're actually writing the code. So we have several decorators that are available to you. Um, rather than just tell you about them, I'm gonna show you a couple examples of actually working with decorators for a custom widget development with TypeScript. All right, so the first one we're gonna look at is called alias of. So alias of is a property decorator. It creates a two-way binding between the property it decorates and inner property of one of its members. So in this example, we're adding the view model name property to the newly created widget, this hello world widget. So we assign type string to this property, so that matches the same type as the view model. So what this means is view model has a property called name that's of type string, and we want to have that property available to the widget as well. So we make alias of the view model dot name, and we give it a type string, so that matches the same type as of the view model. That way it works properly. Now you'll notice there's actually two other decorators below alias of. Um, there's the property decorator and the renewable decorator. The property decorator is used to automatically add a getter, setter, and watch methods that are available to you. And the render decorator is used to update the widget if any of the property values change. So let's look at another example and see the property decorator in action. Okay, so this is the view model for the widget from the previous example. So it extends accessor and has a property called name, which we can now get, set, and watch because we use the property decorator. Then we also initialize it with a string value. So one of the cool things about TypeScript is types. We've talked about that a couple of times now, and I give the name property type string. However, I don't have to do that because TypeScript has this thing called type inference that can actually say, if I pass in a string value when I initialize the variable, it's going to know that the variable should be of type string. So the name colon string line might be a bit overkill, but the benefit that it adds obviously is that it makes my code even more readable. So that if I wasn't passing in a string directly to the value, I could be passing in a variable that also was a string. Um, it's really easy when someone reviews my code or when I review it myself to come down and say, okay, the name property should be of type string. So that makes it a bit more explicit. All this goes along with widget development. So again, we have another uh, very nice guide topic that can guide you through the ins and outs of actually developing your own widget. Um, it'll talk about the prerequisites that you'll need for actually working with TypeScript and widget development. It'll talk about the widget lifecycle and decorators. Um, and then there are two really nice tutorials uh, for creating your own custom widgets that can help you get started. But again, rather than just show you, I'd like, to, rather than just tell you, I'd like to go ahead and show you. So Renee is gonna give um, another nice example of creating custom widgets. So I'm going to pass it over to Renee. Hey, thank you, Noah. Okay, so before I get to the custom widget example here, I actually wanted to actually get to, we saw these, uh, some uh, other examples of how you can use TypeScript with the ArcGIS API for JavaScript. Um, so I have, a, I have a map here, just a very simple application that just got a web map and I've got a search widget. So when you're writing TypeScript with a JavaScript API and you use our typings, you get a few advantages with that in that as you hover over modules that you've brought in, you get access to the documentation. So you have the typings up here. So I said feature layer has an optional property of properties, and that's what the question mark means that you either can uh, define it or not. And then we have actual documentation that comes directly from the SDK. And when you're using this in something like VS Code, you can actually click a link down here and read more, 
and it will open up the documentation for you to take a closer look at. Also, once I've defined uh, my uh, instantiate the feature layer here, for example, I've got layer, I can go ahead and start doing something with it. So I can do layer dot, and I have access now to all these properties and functions that are available on my layer. So for feature layer, I can do query features, query feature count, uh, attachments. I've got access to the pop-up template. I can disable pop-ups and so on. And it's all part of the, the stuff that you get when you use the TypeScript typings that we provide with the JavaScript API. Now let's take a look at another example that's a little bit more involved. So in this example here, what I'm doing is I have an application that I've gone ahead and found my current location, and then I do a search nearby me for restaurants, hotels, and so on. Uh, just some interesting places. I can click on the map. I've got a gas station over here. I've got a, a hotel over here, and I've got a, a nice Taco Bell over here, America's favorite restaurant. So how would you do something like that? So what I have here is I have a small module called Geolocate. And I'm going to take advantage of the Geolocation API that's part of the browser. Now, the Geolocation API has a function called GetCurrentPosition. If I look get, at GetCurrentPosition, it'll tell me in my uh, IDE that it takes a success callback and it takes an error callback in case something goes wrong. Uh, but it's not really a promise. It's asynchronous, but it's not a, a promise that I really want to use. So what I can do is I can define this function, device location. I'm going to tell it that's going to return a promise, and the result of that promise is going to be a position. And that position is the interface for what you get when you do get current position. So when I create this new promise, I have a resolve and reject function. I'm going to pass those functions to get current position in the place of the success callback for resolve, and the, uh, use reject for the error callback here. Now I've gone ahead and wrapped that get current position in a promise that I can take advantage of, and we'll take a look at that in a moment. I also have another module here called places, uh, and this places module has a function called find nearby places, and I'm going to use this to go ahead and use the, um, the locator task that's part of the JavaScript API to go ahead and search for some nearby places. Now again, I have that position interface here that I'm using. I'm just going to pass it the position. So by default, the compiler knows that there is a property on position called coords. So in this method, I can use object destructuring to go ahead and grab that coords property off the position. And I can do some more destructuring to grab the latitude and longitude off of that coords property. Now I can go ahead and create my new point, And I can use the geolocator's address to locations method to go ahead and find some locations nearby me. Now again, using TypeScript, I can go ahead and I can uh, hover over the address to locations method to find out what the parameters are going to be that I want to send to this particular method. Now how would I use something like that? So in here, I have a function called address to features. And in address to features, I'm going to be passing an array of items. Now I want to define that array of items as address candidates. You notice here I'm calling esri.addressCandidate, and pa again, I'm passing an array next to it so the compiler knows it's going to be an array of address candidates. In the TypeScript typings, we have a global object called underscore underscore esri that you can reference. But if you want to shortcut that, you can go ahead and just say import esri equals underscore underscore esri, so you don't have to write this every time you want to grab a typing. This isn't put in your output JavaScript code. This is only used for the typings in TypeScript. They'll be removed when the code gets compiled. Now, once I get those address candidates, I'm going to turn each of them into a graphic. So I automatically know that if I have an address candidate, I have a location property on it. And on that location property, I have access to a Y, or an X, and I forget what I put here, I had an X, so that works out pretty nice. And then I want to use that. So now what I'm going to do is I have a function here called find places. Again, I'm going to do more um, dynamic imports in here. I'm going to pull in those two modules that we saw earlier by saying that, that const geo equals await import geolocate and const places equals await import places. Now I can go ahead and I can use each of these functions to call those promise methods and get my results. So I've got my position, that pass that position to this function here. And again, I can just hover over all of these functions to find out exactly how they can be used and what I can do with them. 
So now that I have my addresses back, I already know it's going to be an array of address candidates, and I can go ahead and use my address to features method here, and I'm just going to go ahead and add those graphics onto the map, which is what we saw here. So next, let's take a look at how you might do some widget development using TypeScript. So in this example, I have got a widget here that is going to be showing me the total number of homicides in an area that I select on the map. So I can just click on my map and I can start moving my mouse around and I'm gonna highlight these points on the map and in my widget, I just wanna show the total number of homicides that are within this darkened area on the map. So how would you do something like that? Let's actually go ahead and go down here. Oops. Let's close all these up and let's look at this widget folder. So what we're really interested in is the widget itself. So if we look at the widget, you can see that I am bringing in uh, all of my decorators to help me out. I am bringing in the uh, renderable decorator, which we saw, which Noah just showed us a little bit earlier, and then the TSX helper. Now this isn't gonna get um, aired out by TypeScript. You're not gonna actually use it in your code, but it does need to get compiled to the JavaScript so that it can build your widget for you. So then I'm gonna bring in my, my view model and an interface in here, and we'll take a look at that in a moment. I'm gonna use the subclass decorator on top of the class I'm creating for my widget. Now, I'm gonna go and extend the base widget class that's got some properties in there that's needed to be able to do the rendering and some other methods like that. And then I have the decorator for the property here. Now, as Noah showed, you can just add this property decorator into your classes, and by default, if you've extended the widget or accessor, it knows that if the, you can now watch for property changes on the view model, which is pretty interesting. When I create my view model, I'm just gonna go and instantiate a brand new view model right off the bat, and I'm not gonna worry about uh, needing to instantiate it later. Then what I can do, and this is the really cool part, is I have a view model. I can say I want a view property on my widget, but that view property is gonna be pointing to the view model's view. That's what the alias of decorator is used for. An alias of decorator uh, points to another property, but also uh, at, does what the property does. So I can still watch for property changes on the view if I wanted to. And if I change the view on the widget, it'll update the view in my view model and vice versa. Now, what I wanna do is that for this widget, I show a number inside there, the total number of homicides. So I'm gonna create an alias of that's gonna to point to the view model's total property. But when this changes, I wanna add this renderable decorator on top of that so that now if this total property changes, the widget is gonna go ahead, it's gonna call the render method again and the render method under the hood is gonna go ahead and check to see if the properties that it needs has changed, if they have changed, it'll go and update the widget. That's how I'm able to update the values shown in the widget. Okay, so let's take a look at the view model for this now, because the view model is where all the work itself is actually happening. You see, I'm doing something pretty cool here. Uh, we have a utility module called Watch Utils, Esri Core Watch Utils. I don't need the whole module, so I'm just gonna pull a couple of functions out of there. I'm gonna pull when once, and again, I can look at documentation for that, and when false once. They pretty much do this almost the same thing. They only fire one time, but when false once, I'm interested in when something is false, and then when once, just no. When something changes one time, that's all I care about. Again, I'm bringing in more decorators in here. I'm defining an interface for the parameters that are gonna be used for the view model. And this interface is gonna extend some default widget properties, and I'm just gonna add the view onto that. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define uh, my array for statistic definitions, and I can look at what the, um, how statistic definitions is used here. And again, I'm subclassing my property, but instead of extending the widget class, which we saw earlier, I'm gonna go ahead and extend the base accessor class. Now the accessor class, uh, the widget class does also extend accessor, so I can still do some cool things there, like I can use the property decorator we saw before that we talked about, and here's the property decorator on the total number, which we saw earlier. Now in my constructor, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna use when once to watch for when the view is updated. So as soon as the view is updated, I call this uh, function init view. And in init view, I'm gonna wait 
for the view to be complete. So view.win is an asynchronous operation that'll finish when the view has gone ahead and um, pulled information for all the layers it's going to use, and it's pretty much ready for you to start doing whatever it is you want to do, whether that's uh, access features of the view or start um, adding widgets to the view. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to grab the first layer that is in the maps layers. And then I'm going to define a layer view here. But I'm going to use a let keyword because I want to wrap this in a try catch statement just in case something happens to go wrong. So I'm going to say let layer view and I'm going to type it as an Esri feature layer view because I know it's already a feature layer. And so I know it's going to end up being a feature layer view under the hood. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the await keyword again. I'm going to use when layer view, which is a promise, pass it the layer. And by default, when layer view, uh, pretty much just, if I look at the documentation here, if I hover over this, you can see here that it returns an Esri.layer view. This is a base layer view class, but I know since I gave it a feature layer that I want it to be an, a feature layer view class when it comes back. So I'm gonna type it as Esri.feature layer view. That comes in handy in a minute, which I'll show you right now. And once all that's done, I just wait for the layer view to uh, updating property to be false one time. I'm going to listen for the click and drag event on the view. When those fire, I call this query stats function. This query stats is what's going to go ahead and create my query and do all the statistics for me. So I can just go ahead and create a query from the layer view, the layers here. Um, I get my properties that are going to be used on my query, pass it my uh, statistics definition. and I'm going to go ahead and wait for a response back. But this is where the fun part comes in because on the layer view, since I typed it as a feature layer view, I automatically have access to the feature layer views functions like query features or query uh, object IDs. And there's some other query properties you can use in here. So that was the point of me typing it as feature layer view so I have direct access to those methods on my module. And then what I do is I just get the response back and I have my total property that I'm gonna go and set on my view model. And once I update this total property of the view model, that in turn will update the total property on the widget itself. And it'll go ahead and re-render the entire widget on the screen for you. I do some other work down here where I go ahead and grab the object IDs for my layer. And again, I can go ahead and look at these types here uh, check the documentation, make sure that I'm using this properly. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and uh, highlight those IDs that I'm already selecting on my map. So I get this really nice interactive map that's part of my widget as well. Now, this is all uh, kind of a lot of stuff. There's a, We talked about uh, the TS config, um, setting everything up. Let's go through these slides again here. But we've, uh, what we can do is that because there's a lot of setup involved with getting TypeScript going and setting up a TS config, is that we actually wrote a tool to help you scaffold your applications right off the bat. And you can get that tool by just running npm install at ArcGIS slash CLI. So what the CLI tool will do for you is that once you install it, you get a global command line tool called ArcGIS. And when you run that command, you have a couple options. You can um, create a new project, you can initialize uh, a project inside a folder, or you can even scaffold your own custom widgets. Now, what do you get with something like that? Let's take a look here. So this is an example of an application that you would get using the CLI. In here, you're gonna get a source folder that's gonna already have um, uh, the uh, index built for you here. Uh, we've got a couple of widgets already pre-built, so I've got an application widget. You already have the tsconfig.json uh, already set up, as well as tslint.json. And tslint, we didn't really talk about, but all tslint does is lets you define some rules as to um, how people write TypeScript. Maybe you want to use single quotes instead of double quotes and so on. Um, that's pretty much all that does. But again, if you uh, look at the app.tsx widget that we built in here, this is just a wrapper for your whole uh, map and the view. 
and it just goes ahead and it's going to define some interfaces and properties for you to be able to use and it gives you a pretty good start to build an application that you can scale. Now, like I said, you can also use the CLI tool to go ahead and scaffold your own custom widgets that'll also build out the test for you. So if we look in the test folder, we also have test for all the widgets and everything else as well. So in summary, uh, today we've taken a look at uh, the ArcGIS API for JavaScript version four, uh, looked at the SDK and some of the guides that we provide, um, especially when it comes to TypeScript and a accessor and widget development. Uh, we looked at what TypeScript is, how it's a superset of JavaScript, how you can take advantage of TypeScript typings and interfaces, as well as all the latest uh, JavaScript features that are built into TypeScript that you can use today. We took a quick look at converting uh, JavaScript to TypeScript, which to start is not too difficult, and then you can get much more sophisticated as you start to scale your applications. Uh, we saw the development resources that Noah showed you, uh, that's part of the SDK and the links to blog posts and everything else that we have. And then we took at, a look at how you can build your own custom widgets using TypeScript. And it is important to note that if you are going to be developing custom widgets with the JavaScript API using our widget framework, then you do need to write uh, them in TypeScript because of the decorators that we use, uh, they only work with TypeScript. So with that, I want to leave you with a quote, it is not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the ones most responsive to change by Charles Darwin. And that's just to show that you know, TypeScript, uh, again, is a very powerful tool that you can use. It, it all compiles down to JavaScript. You don't have to use it. Uh, just the JavaScript team is a big fan of TypeScript, like Noah mentioned. Uh, we've got uh, close to 90% of the JavaScript API right now is written in TypeScript. It's great for very large applications, uh, especially when you need to refactor your code. Uh, it's a really powerful tool. So we're big fans, uh, and we just encourage you to at least give it a shot. And with that, I will open up to any questions. All right. Thank you, Renee. We're now going to begin answering the questions submitted during today's presentation. We've received a few and we will try to get through as many as possible. But whatever we do not get to today, we will address in a GeoNet blog post after this webinar. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. Our first question is, what does AMD mean? Okay, so AMD is uh, means asynchronous module definitions. And AMD was a way um, uh, with JavaScript that you could uh, modularize your code. Uh, basically, it's a way that you could have multiple JavaScript files in your application and then uh, load them asynchronously as needed uh, during the application lifetime. A uh, couple of tools uh, use AMD pretty extensively. Uh, Dojo was one, which the uh, JavaScript API used extensively, Require.js is another, um, and there are plenty of other tools that take advantage of it too. Um, uh, AMD, there's also another version of that called UMD, which is Universal Module Definition, which basically is AMD plus uh, CommonJS combined so that you could use libraries in either uh, case, uh, depending on how you want to load them. All right, perfect. Thank you, Renee. Uh, next question, why is the web map variable in your code declare as a const? So in the samples I showed, if, uh, if I declare a variable as const, I'm essentially telling the TypeScript compiler that, or JavaScript, that I do not, I'm not gonna be changing that variable during the lifetime of its use. Um, and those are all scoped to the block. So uh, that const web map, is scoped to the module I used it in. Um, it's not uh, used in any globals anywhere. Um, and you can actually set up TypeScript to tell you that if I said let web map equals new web map, then I could have some linting in place that says, uh, you know, you, are, you have not changed that variable anywhere, so you probably should change it to const. Um, if I want to say change the web map during the life cycle of its use, I might use let web map equals new web map and then Maybe it's during a function, another operation, uh, where I change the web map, I would say web map equals another web map. And I could change the web map that way. It's, a, it's just a nice syntactical way 
to um, strongly define how you're going to be using your variables in your application. Perfect. Thank you. Next question. Does all of this mean that the Dojo framework can be eliminated when using the ArcGIS JavaScript API with TypeScript? So under the hood, we still use Dojo internally in the JavaScript API, but for users of the JavaScript API, you do not need to use any Dojo at all or even concern yourself that it's there. Uh, by using TypeScript, you can just import the modules you need from the JavaScript API and then uh, build your code in any way you want to. And we have uh, the CLI actually includes the ArcGIS Webpack plugin that will let you build your applications using Webpack. So there's no, not even a Dojo build system in place if you don't want to use it. So for users of the API, Dojo is not something they need to even use. All right. You showed how TypeScript lets you load modules with import instead of require. Is the Angular Esri loader also importable this way? So I'm not 100% familiar with the Angular Esri loader, but the, the regular Esri loader does something very similar where the, um, and so they should work the same way basically, where if you use the Esri loader during the lifetime of your application, and then you require uh, using the loader a particular module, that module is not loaded until you actually use the load module method in the Esri loader. So it's, it's the same concept of lazy loading your applications. Now, if you write in TypeScript and you do import the Esri loader, technically that should work, but I haven't tried it, so I can't say for sure if, um, you know, there might be an error somewhere when it tries to attach itself to the page. All right. Using promises is the most difficult part of ArcGIS API for JavaScript. Does using TypeScript instead of just JavaScript make it easier? Um, it can. Uh, personally, I still somewhat prefer promises most of the time because in a promise chain, um, I know that I can scope variables inside certain then statements, whereas when you're using async await, um, you don't have that same kind of luxury uh, if you need it unless you are uh, wrapping all of your async await calls in try catch, which is definitely a good practice. But with the JavaScript API, uh, we have a lot of asynchronous operations and promises everywhere, and a lot of them can be uh, replaced with async await if that's just a, a way that you like to, to write your code. And the uh, promises in async await is more of a preference for developers rather than a requirement uh, for developers. All right. When I install the ArcGIS typings, does that also install Node, or did we have to have Node installed beforehand? Oh, no, I'm sorry if we didn't make that clear, but, but Node and NPM are requirements when using uh, TypeScript and installing the typings because you need to have NPM available to not only install, type, install TypeScript, but to also install the ArcGIS typings. and um, uh, to install any other tools you might want to use with the API. So yes, Node and NPM are a requirement. All right, thanks. Can you eject an Angular TS config to make this change to AMD? So the in Angular CLI 5, that was possible. With the Angular CLI 6, they have removed the eject method and uh, Last I looked at the issue, they did not want to add it back, but they are, I think, going to offer some certain configuration hooks for developers to uh, update configuration options on their own, but I don't know what the status that is. Why do we want to watch the view model with an accessor? So the view model and accessors in general become really handy because uh, when you have a view model that extends accessor you, and you're able to use those decorators that we showed you like property and alias of, that automatically makes the properties of that uh, view model, which is an accessor, uh, watchable. I mean, you can watch for changes on them. So when you have a widget, a nice way to do it is to have that view model with the properties that your widget will be using and you can just tell the widget using the renderable decorator in combination with the alias of decorator 
to say, no, I want you to watch for this property change in my view model. And when the view model is updated, I need to update my widget or update the view of my widget that people see, um, which is really useful. If not, what you would need to do probably is uh, add in some sort of event system to watch for uh, an event when something changes. Um, if you didn't have the renderable decorator, you would have to add your own uh, watch calls on certain properties. Um, it just makes things a little bit easier to do if you use the decorators we provide, as well as Accessor as part of the API. All right, thanks. Is it possible to use React Native with TypeScript? So I have not successfully gotten React Native to compile with the ArcGIS API for JavaScript and TypeScript. Um, you might be able to get it to work inside of a web view in React Native, but not part of the React Native libraries. All right. And when will version 4.9 of ArcGIS API for JavaScript be released? Well, that's an awesome question because 4.9 will be out tomorrow uh, for the JavaScript API. Wow. The, the typings, the typings for 4.9. So the way the typings work when we do a release is that we publish the typings to a GitHub repo called Definitely Typed, as well as our own JS API resources. But the reason they go to Definitely Typed is because then you can install the typings via npm. So if you look at the Definitely Typed repo, you've got thousands of typings on all oh, thousands, maybe a thousand or more from Angular, React, and everybody else. Uh, we make a pull request for our new typings, and that usually occurs within a couple of days. We've been pretty lucky that the PRs go pretty quick. It's all automated. So the typings for 4.9 will hopefully be available by the weekend, but the release of 4.9 with the JavaScript API will be out tomorrow. All right, that's awesome. Of what you've shown us today, what does not work in the 3x versions of the JS API? Dynamic imports, decorators, any build tools like Webpack need special attention? So we do not have any decorators for 3x, um, but you can still write a TypeScript application using the 3x version of the JavaScript API and use dynamic imports. Uh, that would still work. Um, uh, the typings are generated a little bit differently, but we uh, do have typings for the 3x version of the JavaScript API. And right now, uh, Webpack will not work with the 3x version of the JavaScript API, but it's still something that we are uh, looking into to see if we can make it work somehow. Awesome, thank you. Um, we have someone who is interested in general opinions on Esri Loader versus the CLI. So Esri Loader is really handy if you are building an application using something like the React CLI, Vue CLI, or Angular CLI. So if you're using a CLI from another framework, um, Esri Loader comes in very handy there because uh, like we talked about with the Angular uh, CLI, they do not have any eject uh, method anymore. So it can be kind of difficult to, uh, in like React uh, CLI to kind of, or the create React app to eject the application kind of navigate their Webpack config, make the updates you need. Um, that could be kind of cumbersome and difficult. So the Esri Loader is a really great tool to use in those situations. But if you're building an application from scratch and maybe you want to use React, but you don't no care if you need to use the uh, a CLI for that, you can use our CLI with the Webpack plugin, still use React to build your application and everything would work just fine. So they, they each has their place depending on uh, the tools that you're already using or that you want to use. All right. What about the support of ArcGIS, um, ArcGIS JS API 3X? Is it planned or possible to use? Uh, for a CLI, uh, I think the question may be referring if it's going to be used for CLI. As of right now, no. But if we can figure out how to... Uh, build a 3x application using Webpack, then it will be added as an option to the CLI to build a 3x uh, application uh, for yourself. All right, great, thank you. Is WebMap from JSON supported? Uh, WebMap from JSON currently is not supported in 4x, I believe. Um, that is something that is currently on our plate to work on. 
so that you can load your own. Um, I know a lot of people did this with 3X where so they had their web map uh, configs already built. Uh, that's something that we're working on towards the future. All right, perfect. Is there a boilerplate template with the TypeScript syntax that we can try out? Um, there actually uh, is. Well, it's not really a boilerplate, but you could look at the CLI code. And if you go into the templates folder on GitHub and you look at the app folder in that templates folder, this is a boilerplate of uh, the application that you would get with the scaffolded application. So you can go through here and just kind of um, look at how this application is built that you would get. If you didn't want to install it from the CLI directly first, you can always look at it here. All right, perfect. Will Web App Builder widgets also be based on TypeScript after the integration of API 4X into Web App Builder? Uh, that is not a question I can answer at the moment. I do not work on that project or with that team, but um, maybe we can get that answer free in the blog post later on. All right. Um, what is the advantage of using a view model when creating a widget? So I think we talked about this earlier. The the idea for the view model is when you build your widgets, and take a quick look at the, the one that we just looked at earlier. So if we look at the, the view model that we, we demonstrated here, the view model really does the heavy lifting of the work for your widgets. So all the business logic and everything is built into the view model, and it has its properties that will get updated based on what the view model is doing. The idea of the widget is that the widget is not concerned with any of that business logic or any of the querying or layers or anything like that. The, the widget is only concerned with what it needs to show. So in this case, I'm just gonna show a number. Uh, maybe uh, the widget might take some input it could pass to a view model, but other than that, it's just kind of a, um, a, a dummy kind of state that updates based on what the view model itself does. So that's where the real advantage is. It's a separation of concerns uh, when you're building out your widgets and your applications. All right, and have you used Dojo 3 with the API? Uh, so the um, we have done some work with Dojo 3. And actually, if you look at the Forex version of the API, uh, the latest versions of Dojo are included as part of the API. They're not quite used yet, but we are uh, moving forward with trying out parts of the Dojo API that we want to use under the hood. Um, for example, we're uh, introducing the uh, use of the abort signal in the uh, 4.9 version of the API, and that's something you can use with Esri Request. It just lets you uh, be able to cancel the request itself. Now we're using the shim from Dojo 3 for the uh, uh, abort uh, in there. But it's something that we are currently testing. All right, and for our very last question, when will 3.2x, uh, 2.6 version of the J JavaScript API come out? 3.26 will be out tomorrow, along with 4.9. All right, well, thank you very much, everybody. And on behalf of Esri and our presenters, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.